I think for anyone who's successful in the business of defending truck drivers and trucking companies, there's a few things. First of all, um, you don't ever put empathy aside. The, the moment you start to look at a case only as a, uh, as a case, and not as involved people who were involved through mere happenstance, usually, uh, with a catastrophic event that has forever altered lives, you can't ever lose focus of that. I'm attorney Dave Craig, managing partner and one of the founders of the law firm of Craig, Kelly & Follows. I've represented people who have been seriously injured or who have had a family member killed in a semi or other big truck wreck for over 30 years. Following the wreck, their lives are chaos. Often they don't even know enough about the process to ask the right questions. It is my goal to empower you by providing you with the information you need to protect yourself and your family. In each and every episode, I will interview top experts and professionals that are involved in truck wreck cases. This is After the Crash. Today is After the Crash guest is Michael Langford. Um, what Michael is a very successful uh, trial lawyer. Uh, he was uh, very skilled. Uh, I had opportunities to go against him uh, multiple times. He was a partner in the law firm, the Scopolitas Law Firm, which is a unique firm because all they do really is transportation law. Um, and they do all, all different types of transportation law. Uh, only part of it is litigation, but they do all kinds of other stuff. And, and Michael uh, was a partner there. He uh, was a very successful trial lawyer as well as an appellate lawyer uh, for, and, and handled cases all over the country. Um, he defended commercial motor vehicle carriers, as well as truck drivers in wrongful death cases and serious injury cases. Um, he was a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and chairman of the American College of Transportation Attorneys. Uh, and like me on the plaintiff side, he, he goes around and, and spoke frequently at defense lawyers conferences or insurance industry conferences and spoke to lawyers on how to handle these type of cases and what was the best way to protect their clients and, and their drivers. Uh, Michael, welcome to the uh, the podcast. Thanks, Dave. It's my pleasure. It was always a pleasure to litigate with you, against you, and so now I'm I'm happy to talk with our audience a bit about what we both do. Yeah, and and Mike has pivoted in his career for a little over a year now. Um, he moved out of the trial and appellate world um, and has moved into the mediation world. He's joined a group called the Mediation Group, which is a group that we like to use, which is a bunch of experienced trial lawyers. And they, the great thing about that group is they have lawyers on, on all different sides. They have all, tons of experience handling all different types of cases. And they've come together and they, they provide uh, top-notch mediation services uh, to, to the clients. So first of all, Michael, how, how, how's that transition? Are you, how's that, how did that go? Oh, it's going well. Thanks. I, I have explained to a lot of people now I'm a peacemaker, not an agitator. So that... Uh, uh, it, it's been it's, it's been a nice move for me. I, there's parts about uh, being in the courtroom uh, that I definitely miss. The advocacy part, um, representing the client, trying to see a case from begin from from cradle to grave, from beginning to end, is a fascinating process. I certainly miss aspects of that. Uh, there's a fair amount of stress, as you well know, in trying to provide uh, the most perfect representation you can. Understanding the perfection is always a goal rarely attainable, uh, but it does create a lot of pressure. So I do enjoy the aspect now that I'm involved for a day, maybe sometimes two days with someone's case, uh, trying to help lawyers and their clients uh, to achieve an optimal result, which is usually a settlement and not a trial. I'm enjoying the variation, uh, the variety. Um, it, it's, a, it's a different pace, but it's, it's an enjoyable pace. So it's going well, thanks. And so, Mike, I, you know, as I said in the beginning, I mean, you tried cases all over this country um, and defended uh, commercial motor vehicle carriers, uh, semi-truck drivers, um, and other people in the transportation industry. Um, and, and one of the things, you were really good at it. Um, you were very good. You had a great reputation. And I'm kind of curious as to what skill set do you think made you so good? What, what qualities, what, what characteristics do you think you brought to the table that helped you be successful at what you did? Well, thank you for that. First of all, that's that's a high compliment coming from you. Um, I think for anyone who's successful in the business of defending truck drivers and trucking companies, there's a few things. First of all, um, you don't ever put empathy aside. The, the moment you start to look at a case only as a, 
uh, as a case and not as involve people who were involved through mere happenstance, usually uh, with a catastrophic event that has forever altered lives. You can't ever lose focus of that. The moment you lose focus of that, <clears throat> and I'm talking about the people who were injured, the plaintiffs, the people you represent. I'm talking about the truck drivers whose lives have been forever transformed because of perhaps a mistake that they've may, made and the guilt that they li live with. Um, the second thing I would say um, is that you have to have like a coach um, and that you got to have a game plan and you need to, to, to recognize that early on, you can't just let things happen. You need to uh, orchestrate uh, the right experts, the right legal strategic moves, gathering the right facts, understanding what are the important points, and being prepared in either direction. Uh, those are really uh, two of the most important aspects, I think, of being a good defense lawyer for the trucking company is bring your empathy and bring your game plan. And in using the sports analogy, making a, an occasional audible as your facts may change and as the law might change as presented. Uh, so um, you know, one of the things that I think that, you know, I always also respected about you and, 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 and you did bring empathy. I mean, you, you did understand that and you did put together great teams, but one of the other things that I think is underrated sometimes when I go up against folks is the knowledge. Um, you know, the commercial motor vehicle world is, is different than just the car crash world. I mean, there's different laws, there's different rules, there's different in industry standards. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things that are applicable. And what, you know, how much knowledge do you think you have to have? And, and, and how did you accumulate that knowledge over, the, over your career? Well, that's a good point. I, I learned very early on that a, that a truck uh, semi truck crash or commercial motor vehicle crash is not simply a big car crash. I mean, there's yes, I mean, there's 26,001 pounds plus, and that is certainly uh, relevant at, because of the, the mass itself can cause a, a terrific gravity of injuries. But it's way more complicated because it's a, we're always dealing in a regulated environment. Um, and so the Department of Transportation Regulations, we often commonly refer to it as the DOT regs, as promulgated by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. You really do have to know those details. You have to know how a driver gets qualified and then you have to determine was that driver uh, properly qualified. You have to determine the rules of the road. Uh, you and I have had some cases over the years involving weather issues and whether or not a driver, a commercial motor vehicle driver, should be operating the vehicle given the weather conditions. That's not present for non-commercial motor vehicle drivers. Um, certainly the logs, the, the, uh, the hours of service is a big component. Um, what they, uh, the telematics and the, the, what's involved with trucks these days and the technology, those are all aspects you just simply don't have in a, in a common vehicle accident. So how did I acquire that information? Um, in combination of having the right, uh, having experts teach me. Um, on the job experience, doing a lot of reading. Uh, I operated in a uh, in certain environments, certain controlled environments, semi trucks myself on skid pads, so that I could understand what it was like to uh, jackknife or to change gears and what that meant. Um, so, so just kind of a combination of variety of things that it it takes about thirty years to completely figure out. And that's one thing. I mean, as I remember, as I recall, I think you went right out of law school into the Scopolitas firm. Um, and so that kind of was your whole career was in that area. So I would assume that that knowledge becomes cumulative after time. Yes, it, it really does. And in fact, I even law clerk for the Scopolitas firm. So, yeah, a year before I graduated from law school, I was acquiring trucking knowledge. So. Um, you know, I think that, you know, um, obviously all the years of experience obviously helped you, the, the specialized training that you went to. I, I know I'm the same way. I've learned through a lot of experts that I've worked with over the years. And as I've gotten different types of cases, I've learned of different areas. I mean, it's so, such a broad area uh, of law and there's so many different types of cases uh, that, that happen. And so, um, but I think that's, you know, these, the folks that this is geared towards are people, average everyday people who may have had the misfortune of having uh, one of these type of wrecks. Uh, they've been hit by an 18 wheeler or a semi and, and or other big truck, and they don't know what to do. Um, they're, they're trying to figure out what kind of lawyer should I hire? And, and I think in the commercial motor vehicle era world, you have a sophisticated purchaser of legal services. 
Um, most trucking companies know what they need. But the average everyday person may never have ever hired a lawyer before in their lives. And so it's the first time they're faced with that. What characteristics do you think that the plaintiff lawyer, the lawyer representing the victims of a wreck, um, should have or should what should they be looking for? Right. Well, it's a good question. And I'll say this before I address specifically your question. I mean, all those folks who are thinking about uh, hiring an attorney because they or their loved ones have been injured or killed in an accident, keep in mind that some of the large trucking companies I represented uh, would have several accidents a day. Now, not all of them are catastrophic. Some of them are fender bender kind of minor accidents, but in combination, they would have several accidents a day, be involved in dozens of fatalities a year and probably daily be involved in an accident where someone is injured. And so to use your term, because I think it's a good one, that makes a trucking company like that uh, a sophisticated consumer of legal services because they're doing it every single day, determining which lawyers they need to hire, uh, thinking about which experts those lawyers need to hire, um, what are the, uh, what's the due diligence they need to do on preservation of, of items and documents. And so now to your question, so what's that mean? What that means is to kind of balance things out to make sure that the, the person hiring uh, legal services is at least on equal footing. They need to hire a lawyer who likewise has a, a large acumen when it comes to trucking knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of good attorneys out there who can handle personal injury cases, but you don't want to hire a medical malpractice lawyer, or maybe somebody who specializes in um, pharmaceutical uh, product liability for a trucking case because they are so factually different. So if I was a consumer, um, meaning a person who was hiring a, a bodily injury attorney uh, for myself or for a loved one, I would want to know first and foremost, how much experience does that attorney have that I'm interviewing? Number two, how much experience do they specifically have in trucking? Number three, what about this particular trucking case makes it extremely important that a trucking lawyer be involved. Number four, I'd want to know what is that game plan. I want to hear what are the things that we need to do because this is a large trucking case. And then I also would want the lawyer to, to, to also provide me some recognizance on the trucking company, perhaps the truck driver, uh, what is the background on the company and the driver, how might that become relevant to the case, um, the venue. Uh, some venues are particularly important to know for purposes of trucking. Um, I, those are some of the things that I would want to know. And then, then finally, I would want the, the trucking lawyer that I was considering hiring to tell me what experts I need in this case and how those experts can bring uh, extra value to my case. Yeah. And, and how important is it, if, if at all, um, and I agree with all of those things, but how important is it at all, if at all, that they are a successful trial lawyer? Um, because not all lawyers, I mean, I know a lot of lawyers, I mean, my, my law firm and I go to trial regularly, um, but I know not all law firms do. Um, right. Is that important? You know, do you think if you were picking somebody uh, or for a family member or recommending somebody, would you want them to have been a, a trial lawyer? Absolutely, because here, here's the, the part that, that probably not a lot of people talk about. Uh, hiring a trial lawyer who doesn't really try cases is like hiring a surgeon who doesn't really do surgery. <laughs> you wouldn't do it um, because here's the bottom line that uh, we hope, and as a mediator now, I can doubly say this, we hope that in the end a case settles. But the other side knows as they're making a determination on how much to offer for settlement, they know whether or not the threat of trial is real or not. Uh, the dirty little secret in certain circles is that there are some so-called trial lawyers that simply don't try cases. And I can promise you the defense knows that. And because the defense knows that, they will value the case accordingly. There is no real chance, they may say, that this case will ever go to trial. So in the game of poker, which is sometimes what settlement negotiations are, will come up to a certain level and we know they will eventually take it. However, if the defense knows that the plaintiff uh, attorney who's been hired really does try cases, then the bluff gets called. And at a certain point, the, the, the trucking company may want not want to try this case because the facts are bad, the venues are bad, or maybe because the plaintiff's lawyer just has that good of a reputation. 
And that's all our important components to, to eventually deciding how much the trucking company will pay or not pay. In short, will the plaintiff attorney actually try a case? If they don't, if, if they don't have a reputation for doing so, you'll probably get less than settlement. And, and I think that uh, one of the things I encourage people to do, because people watch this podcast for all over the country, and so they may not be considering, they may be picking a lawyer in California for all I right. know. But I think that it's an extraordinarily important decision. All the things that you mentioned and discussed are very relevant. And it's one of the most important decisions that may, a family be, may be making. If they've lost their, their husband or their, or their wife um, and they were the breadwinners of the family, um, it can have a major impact on their children and, their, and going, their lives going forward. And I would encourage people to interview people. Um, there's nothing wrong with sitting down and talking to people because not only do I think you have to have all those characteristics, the knowledge, the experience, the, uh, I guess one thing we didn't talk about are the resources because these aren't cheap cases uh, and the trial experience um, and, and, a, and a game plan. And you, want to, and you ought to talk, talk to the lawyers about that game plan. But you also may be working with this lawyer or this law firm for a significant period of time, and you ought to get along with them. I mean, they ought to be people who you like and who you're comfortable with, because quite frankly, there's more involved than just getting the recovery. There's a, there's a bunch of good attorneys out there, but not everybody's the same. And, um, and the reality is, I, and from my perspective, if I was recommending somebody, I would say, go interview them, make sure they have all the background, the knowledge, the experience. And, but then on top of that, make sure that there's somebody that you, you're comfortable with. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and just to, to add some specifics to some of the, the comments you made, I mean, it is not unusual for a trucking case like this to be in existence, even with due diligence by everyone, all the attorneys working hard, the court setting the docket as they, they need to set it for these cases to be around anywhere from three to five years. And you hope not. You hope you can get a case resolved in one to two years, but the truth of the matter is some cases are so complicated, there can be travel throughout the country, uh, court dockets in certain venues are crowded, there can be mediations that don't resolve the matter, uh, there can be appeals, and so the notion that, that a case can be around for three to five years is not unusual. So first point being, you had, you, you, it's not just a, a short transaction, it's not a simple matter where you hire somebody for 30 or 60 days. I mean, you think about the, the last, if you've ever bought a house, uh, you thought that was a long transaction. We'll multiply that by three to five times is how much we're talking about. Um, and then secondly, um, uh, the point you raise is, is a good one also about um, the, having the resources. Um, a large trucking cases requires lot, lots of experts. I mean, I could easily list five or six experts that almost every large trucking case cost. Um, also, and that's even before we get into the medical experts if someone is catastrophically injured. And so the notion that it could cost on the expense side, we're not talking about attorney fees, but expense side, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars is not unusual. And so that's a good interview question to find, can, is this something that the law firm is capable of fronting? And if they're not capable of fronting, am I going to get the right experts? Uh, and, and I can promise you that the large trucking companies that I represented understood that early on and they reserved accordingly to spend that kind of money on experts. I think, and I see, unfortunately, I get cases that are referred to me by other attorneys that have sat on them thinking that maybe the case would settle um, and they sat on them for a year or, or you know, a you know, year and a half. And then they kicked into me and they spent no money on the front end. And, um, and, you know, I've tried a case, you know, I've tried case. Um, I think the most money I've ever had a trucking case was close to a quarter of a million in an underwrite guard case. And so it was complicated because there were multiple defendants. There was multiple, uh, it was a, it was a liability that was, uh, based upon the landowner and my client and the trucking company and the underwrite. I mean, there was a whole bunch of different types of expert involved. And, and, you know, if you don't have, if you're not willing to put that money in and hire the right experts and the best experts, I guarantee you, you're not going to get a good result because number one, I think the trucking company is going to know, well, guys, this law firm is not hiring the right people. They're not much of a threat or they're not thinking of, they're not really going to go to trial. Um, or secondly, they just don't have the resources to do it. So I, I, I agree. I think that, you know, and, and I see a lot of law firms that you know don't have the resources to invest in these type of cases. Yeah, it's all very true and you know I 
I was often getting hired within, you know, an hour or two after the accident, certainly within 24 hours of the accident. And I was hiring experts inside of the 24 hours, maybe 48 hours, 72 hours. But in the first week, it would not be unusual for me to retain maybe as many as five experts um, because I wanted to get those experts the most relevant evidence. I wanted them to accumulate evidence while it was still fresh, while it was still needed. And, you know, everything from from skid marks on the roadway to downloading telematics, um, downloading um, electronic control modules or also known as the black box. Um, sometimes I would hire human factors experts who would take into account the way that a truck driver or perhaps the other driver perceived and reacted to a situation and how they perceived and reacted might depend on weather conditions or more importantly, lighting conditions. And I'd want to make sure that we got them early because lighting conditions can change, artificial lighting, uh, positioning of the moon, um, uh, other factors that can affect lighting. And we want to get all those folks in early so that we can get the best possible physical evidence uh, accumulated. And if you wait a year or two, it may be long gone. And that's, and that's the advantage of on your end, uh, you know, a family hiring you early, because if you don't, you could already be well behind the eight ball. And, and I think that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think, um, you know, folks don't realize that, you know, as you mentioned earlier, this is unfortunately a part of the business in the, in the transportation world. There's going to be a certain number of wrecks just because of how many vehicles are out there. And certainly not all of them are caused by the truck drivers. I mean, there are really good truck drivers out there. I represent some truck drivers that have been hit by other truck drivers, but there's, there's good people. They're good truck drivers. There's good people out there. But regardless, there's going to be wrecks and there's going to be some bad wrecks because of how big these vehicles are. And some of them are going to be caused by the trucking company and the truck, truck drivers. But that's, it's, it's, they are prepared for that. That's part of their business. And they hired people like you or your firm. Uh, they knew ahead of time. I mean, they knew who their lawyers were before the wreck happened. Um, they, and so I think that gives you a great advantage. Um, and let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, it's, a lot of times it's called a rapid response team. I know that you were very involved in that. Um, but I don't think my, I don't think when I talk to my clients and they come in, they have no idea that the trucking companies are already working on the case because most of the time they're deal. I mean, I've had tr truck lawyers and, and claims people at the scene while the scene is still active before my family has even got notified. Um, and that does give you all a bit of an advantage. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. What's involved in that? Yeah, sure. Well, the, it's commonly known as a 24-7 rapid response team. So that means the lawyer is available uh, for the trucking company 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I, I get so many phone calls in the middle of the night that it would have been a complete shock to me if I had gotten a phone call in the middle of the night and actually had something to do with my family. That's just not typically the way that it worked. Uh, the, you know, so my clients knew they could call me any time uh, of the night and that and the folks that I engaged, which were field adjusters that would go out and run investigations or accident reconstructionist. I had their phone numbers, their cell phone numbers, 24 hours, seven days a week. So it was not unusual in the middle of the night or any time of day. Um, I could get phone calls. I was disp dispatching phone calls. And depending on this, I've taken planes, uh, private planes to immediately go to a remote scene of an accident. I've certainly driven to many accident scenes. Um, and, and part of it is to talk to the truck driver, to get to the truck driver before anyone else does, um, to be able to counsel the driver. You know, sometimes depending on the circumstances, I may also retain a criminal defense attorney. So the criminal defense attorney can provide counsel to the driver about giving statements to the police and whether or not uh, this is an interrogation and whether or not they're under custody. I mean, those are all factors that we have to think of and then preserving evidence. And I'll also say this, another, another ask, do you realize, especially as we approach the summer season, how many of these catastrophic accidents happen in construction zones? And that is really pertinent to make sure that all lawyers who are involved in the case are retained early because construction scenes change. They can change simply by cones, uh, by the determination of this lane, not that lane, by the determination of an S curve 
curve as opposed to to a, to an L maneuver. I mean, um, those are all factors that go into uh, construction, and the construction might or might not have been a factor related to the accident. But the mere fact that it happened in a construction zone means that, by definition, it's ever changing and evolving. So it's important to get there early. So um, I would again often be at a scene within hours after the accident while uh, I could talk to the police officers, I could see the evidence itself, I could talk to the drivers. Um, and so that was always a major advantage. And by the time I got the call from the plaintiff's attorney that they had just been retained uh, by a family, I, I could be several weeks or several months well into the investigation and um, I had the information and they didn't at that point. And, and how important, I guess, you know, um, obviously the, the family, uh, the victims of, the, of a semi-truck wreck are, uh, are behind because they're dealing with the catastrophic events. Um, but normally I find, you know, the, I've been hired quickly, but not nearly as quickly as you. I've been hired usually, you know, sometimes the quickest I can think of is maybe within a day or two. Um, usually it's a week or so out. Um, and usually there's somebody in the family who's looking out for the, the close family members and saying, hey, you ought to do something to preserve the evidence. But how important is it for these, these folks, the ordinary folks who have family members who've been catastrophically injured or killed uh, to hire a plaintiff lawyer um, as quickly? Well, it's important, and you use the word preserve, and that's the right word to use because there is a, there's a duty to preserve um, that exists in the law. But sometimes there's gray area. I mean, does a truck driver, for instance, have a duty to preserve um, all the uh, evidence on his phone that would show any app that he or she had open while driving? Well, it, it depends. Um, do they do they have a duty? Uh, do, does the trucking company have a duty to preserve not just the video of the accident, but video that they may have from a dash cam of the hour leading up to the accident, which might or might not show that this driver was uh, not engaged in safe behavior. I could give countless examples of gray area about where information should or not should not be preserved. If the family hires a lawyer early on, that lawyer can send letters and have conversations with the trucking uh, company's lawyer in which the terms can be negotiated or they can be expanded as to what's preserved. If the family does not hire an attorney early on and maybe months later, then a lot of that evidence has, has, has been purged in the ordinary course of business, but that determination was up to the trucking company and the trucking lawyer. And then when the information is requested many months later, it's awfully easy to say and not inappropriately said, but nonetheless said, well, that information was purged we kept what was relevant. So bringing in, if the family brings in a lawyer of their choice, the family and their lawyer gets to, gets to play a part in the determination of what is and isn't relevant evidence to be preserved. And, and we don't routinely send out preservation letters to everybody that's involved. Um, but again, and I think your, your point on the construction zones, I'm seeing more and more, there hasn't been a, a year um, that I can remember in recent history where I haven't been hired by several people, several different crashes throughout the country that happened in construction zones. And like you said, those the, the signage uh, is extraordinarily important. Um, and depending on what kind of highway it is, what kind of state, what state it is, I mean, sometimes the companies have videos that they run through mornings every morning, but sometimes they don't. Um, and, you know, we, we hire people who cloud point scan those, drive through the construction zones, and, and cloud point scan the whole construction zone, but it doesn't do us any good if it's been changed, you know, if it's, it's been rotated or altered. Um, I've had, I mean, back in the old days, I used to fly planes over and take photographs, you know, because that's the only technology I had. But I can remember there were so many lawyers that weren't doing that, but we would fly planes over because we never knew when something would change or wouldn't, whether, you know, whether an easement, you know, when, well, the way you pull out of a gas station, whether that's safe or not, it may be changed by the time two years down the road or a year and a half down the road or whenever you get to a point where you're doing depositions. Um, and so I think that um, you're absolutely right. But both the plaintiff and the defendants, the trucking company, but also the, the plaintiff, the families uh, want to make sure that they look and see 
you know, how did this wreck happen? I, and, and clients never hire me to say, how much money do I get? I've never had a client ask me, oh, how much money am I going to get? They always want to, their first question to me is, why did this happen? And in order to do that, you have to get hired early. And the other part of that, while we're on the subject of construction zone accidents, you may in that process of figuring out how to happen, you might come to the conclusion that maybe the truck driver wasn't at fault, or perhaps the truck driver didn't bear all the fault, that there might have been a violation of the uniform traffic and motor control, uh, uh, road control. And you've also got issues with sometimes the subcontractors. You mentioned signage. There could be signage issues. Uh, there could be civil engineering issues. Um, in other words, you might have a situation where you file a lawsuit with multiple defendants and you wouldn't know that if you hadn't gotten out there early enough to truly inspect the accident scene. Yeah, you talk about the old days with planes. Of course, the new days now, that still needs to be done, but it's usually done with drones. Right. Yep, absolutely. And that's, you know, capturing the evidence. I mean, uh, the, you know, what we're both talking about is preserving the evidence. Uh, you used to preserve it for the trucking industry and the trucking truck, trucking companies, motor carriers, the drivers. I preserve it for my clients, getting out quickly. Um, and the way we do that is, uh, is different. The, the technology that's in these trucks the technology is in these cars. I mean, I had one out in Iowa uh, where, you know, somebody was in, in a Cadillac, a brand new, and it's amazing how much technology, I mean, there are computers basically in cars that are recording everything that we're doing. And that's, I mean, I assume you've seen that change as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and most of the, most of the uh, major auto manufacturers now, they have airbags. And when the airbag deploys, it goes back and captures somewhere between five to seconds, five to seven seconds of what the speed was and when the hard brake was deployed. Um, and uh, with the trucking companies using the black box or also known as the electronic control module, uh, you can capture um days of activities and if and, and and specific to that particular truck and that particular activity at least an hour, up to an hour of activity um and so it used to be you'd have to measure skid marks and you'd have to look at yaw marks and there were some laws of physics and still some of that is done as a backup check but the reality is there's so much capturing now inside the vehicle. If that information is preserved, obtained, downloaded, it can give you the entire story of the accident in a way that just simply didn't exist 30 years ago. And, and, and a lot of trucking companies now are monitoring their drivers. Um, and that technology, again, wasn't there. I mean, we know a lot. In more. real time monitoring. Yep. Yeah. And we know a lot more uh, by capturing that data than what we ever used to be. I had a case down in Kentucky where uh, some a metal fell off of a flatbed driver, driver continued to drive. Um, and uh, when we, you know, it was luckily there's a FedEx person who saw the, the markings on the tractor. And so they thought they knew who it was. We reached out to them. They said, no, we had no drivers in that area. Uh, we sued them anyway, because the FedEx person was pretty confident. We got hired quick. And we were able to get a private investigator, talk to this driver. And this driver's like, I'm pretty confident it was this truck. And so we sued him. And the guy said, no, the closest we had, this was down in Louisville. Closest driver we had was sleeping in Shelbyville, Indiana. But through the, the, the capturing the data, the electronic logs and the GPS system that this trucking company was using, we were actually able to show that, no, this truck driver was in Kentucky at the time. Um, where we would have, you know, initially we wouldn't have been able to do that. And so there is so much more information that's out there than there ever has been. And it continues to grow. Absolutely. Um, it, it has continued to grow. I'd say, you know, just, just for simple example, um, five or six years ago, I was having conversations with clients about whether they should or should not put dash cams in their vehicle, you know, outward facing, inward facing, um, one of the concerns was what if it shows that our driver was misbehaving, then that could be used against us in litigation. Eventually what happened, that was sort of the claim side, but the safety side won because the safety side uh, in the trucking industry was convinced that having uh, inward facing uh, cameras would alter truck drivers' behavior to the good, and having outward facing uh, cameras would either one show that the truck driver did not have fault for the accident and so could be used as a great defense, or two, uh, tell us that the truck driver was at fault and so we wouldn't have to engage in much guessing and we could just see what we can do to get the case resolved. So that was a 
conversation just as recently as five or six years ago. Should we, should we not? Here are the pros, here are the cons. I think if you look at the top 100 trucking companies in terms of number of trucks, I don't think it's an exaggeration to probably say that close to 90% of those trucking companies now have dash cams, either inward facing, outward facing, or both. And that's just in the last five years. Yeah. And we're seeing, I mean, not only are we seeing more wrecks captured by dash cams on semi-tractor trailers, but I'm also seeing them on cars. I mean, there's more cars on the road that actually have dash cams on their cars that are capturing it. And it's amazing to me how many wrecks are captured by surveillance cameras. I mean, again, four or five years ago, I didn't see nearly as many. Now, the first thing I do when I get hired is send private investigators out to the scene and look for any cameras, not only in the area where the wreck happened, but all the way back, you know, and the route that the truck would have come for, you know, quite a few miles to see if there's anything captured especially in bad weather or, or construction zone or whatever. But it's amazing how many cameras are out there. There really are Con, uh, gas, gas stations, convenience stores, banks. Um, they're sort of notorious for having outside cameras uh, that are for the purpose of mostly monitoring their premises. But inside uh, the, the lens of the camera also is an intersection or the roadway. And so that's a great point. Um, I've often had investigators um, go out and capture that. And, you know, the gas station that just happens to be at the intersection where a bad accident happens doesn't, but it didn't happen at the gas station. They have no reason to preserve that information unless they're specifically requested to do so. Um, and typically, if if that's not caught, then it's a rolling take, a rolling video. It's gone after 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. So another point on preservation and the importance of it. So um, so a wreck happens and we talked about, you know, preserving the evidence and what's involved in that. Uh, the next step, so, you know, the family hires a lawyer. And so then a decision has to be made whether we file a lawsuit or not. Um, obviously, you, the defense side, the trucking company's attorney has already been hired. They've got their ahead of the game and their investigation. Um, and, you know, sometimes um, a lot. And, and, and I guess there's only there's a handful of truck wreck lawyers that defend commercial motor vehicle carriers. I mean, Unlike the, you know, there's lots and lots of lawyers, but I, I run up against the same law firms um, around the country um, that handle these cases. So they're well prepared and equipped to handle these. Um, so do, do you normally see what does the plaintiff lawyer file suit right away? Do they reach out to you, uh, to the trucking attorney to see, can we come to some kind of agreements? What was what, your experience? Well, I've had every experience. I have had moments where a lawsuit is filed uh, before um, I've ever had a conversation with the lawyer. I've had situations where I have typically sent uh, a, some type of letter of representation uh, to the family. Um, you, sometimes it's a condolence letter, depending on the circumstances, but it's known that I represent the trucking company. And I will often get a phone call from the lawyer and, and saying, you know, what's your position on the case? Um, are you defending it on liability? What are the insurance limits? Um, what do you foresee being the issues? And then I will have a similar conversation when I get that call from the, the, the lawyer who's recently been retained by the attorney. Uh, what's the, what are the injuries? What's the medical situation? How do you see liability? I have had, uh, I've had cases, um, some, some really large cases that I've been able to settle within months because there was a mutual understanding uh, that the issues were understood enough that there didn't need to be mountains of litigation and years of discovery in, in order to reach a mutual understanding. Sometimes their accidents are well understood. It's a rear end collision that happened at a stoplight or a stop sign. It's our, my truck driver's fault. Someone was killed. It's a matter of determining what is the value of the case as value is defined inside the law, not as value is always defined inside humanity. Um, but that is that. But, so I've had a wide range of situations. I've also had moments where the trucking company believes the driver did nothing wrong. We've got the evidence to support it. I get the phone call from the uh, lawyer recently retained by the family. And I'll say, I'm, you know, I'm really sorry about the accident. We all are sorry about the accident, but this is just one that we're not going to voluntarily pay money 
to you. So I've had every imaginable situation. I have always encouraged uh, those who do plaintiff's work to pick up the phone and have some phone calls. Um, there could be years of litigation avoided or information learned or at the least information exchanged between the parties. So at least there's an understanding as we go forward in litigation. We've had, I mean, I've had cases where we don't know who the attorney's going to be and we're worried about preserving evidence. So the first thing we do is send out a preservation letter um, and, and then usually we'll get a phone call back from whoever the attorney is rather than the trucking company. And, uh, and a lot of times you can work out the agreements on how we're going to go about downloading. And especially this, in this day and age, I mean, we have a rapid response team ourselves. I mean, I know who I'm going to call, what experts I'm going to call, depending on where this wreck was. And I can usually work with a trucking attorney and they'll have their experts ready and we'll go have a mutual time where we go download it. Um, and, and do all of the preservation of the, the certainly of the vehicles. And that's Other a good times. way to do it. It serves as a bit of a checks and balance as well. Everyone is, you know, doing it at the same time. There's a cooperation with the information you get, we will share with you. The information you get, you'll share with us. Um, there, there's, there, you know, everything that we want to do to your truck, we can do to your car. Um, you want to look, download my driver's smartphone. We want to, you want to, you know, we'll download your driver's smartphone. So there's some, some equaling out that happens in addition to the check and balance of making sure that everything's sort of on the up and up. I always like doing it that way when we can. And I think that's, and, and there's a certain law firms we can do that with, and there's others uh, that are a little less cooperative. And uh, so we file and, you know, and then the court will let us do those things. Uh, normally, once we file, then, then we work out the agreement anyways, rather than get the court involved. Um, one of the things when we file um, and on the plan side, I mean, we have to look at where we're filing it. You alluded to it earlier is that the jurisdiction matters. I mean, sometimes in these trucking cases where the case is filed, uh, makes a difference. And, and, and again, you know, a lot of lawyers just look at it and say, well, where's the wreck? Where did the wreck happen? Um, and we look at it, you know, before we file, we try to look and see where is the best place that we can file this lawsuit legitimately. Um, and, and then sometimes we file in state court. Uh, sometimes we file in federal court. If we file in state court, usually we're removed to federal, to federal court. Maybe you can explain to the, you know, the average person out there listening to this, what's the difference and, and how important is the venue? Sure. Well, we'll start. There's there's two ways that that venue can be uh, changed, if you will. The first, and the, and the plaintiff gets to choose the venue to begin with, um, because they are the one who file files the lawsuit. So I'm usually reacting to the venue decision. Um, you have to file in state. Well, let me put it this way: you can file in federal court. Uh, under for two reasons. One, that there's a federal statute or a federal issue. Um, at, at play. And usually in a trucking case, you don't have that. The other possibility is that there's diversity of citizenship between the plaintiff and all of the defendants. So what that means is that if the plaintiff is from Indiana, the trucking company is from Wisconsin, um, and the truck driver is from Nevada, then suddenly you now have three different uh, states. And so you have diversity of citizenship. And if the amount in controversy is $75,000 or more, which is usually the case in a trucking case, I can remove the case to federal court. But the moment that a plaintiff and one of the defendants, not all of the defendants, but just one of the defendants have the same citizenship, that's called destroying diversity of citizenship. And you cannot remove the case to federal court. So you remain in state court. Typically, on the defense side, representing trucking companies, uh, we would rather be in federal court than state court. I say typically, it's not a rule that always applies, but more often than not, we'd rather be in federal court if we can be. And so we can go through a process called removal, which allows us to take your state court action and actually move it to federal court if we do it within 30 days of the moment we become aware that it's one that we can remove it to federal court. The reasons why we'd rather be in federal court typically is that um, the, the federal judges are a bit more stringent about what comes in to trial by way of the rules of evidence, number one. Number two, it's easier to get summary judgment 
on um, on claims in federal court. Now, usually in a personal injury or wrongful death case, it's tough to get summary judgment, but sometimes there are certain kinds of claims that are brought, maybe negligent hiring, negligent retention, negligent entrustment. Those are the type of claims, punitive damages that sometimes we want to file summary judgment on. In federal court, because of the variations in standards, um, it's usually easier to get summary judgment. So that's the reason why we often want to be there. And then in some federal courts, and not all federal courts, in some federal courts, you get um, um, a, a case management plan that sets the order of experts. And more often than not, the plaintiffs typically have to disclose their experts first. We like that because we can see who your experts are and we can react to that. Uh, in most state courts, there can be a, something similar to that, but there's not as much detail often with the expert reports. So um, in combination, those are the reasons why we'd rather be in federal court than state court. Do you find that um, what the, the venue that someone files in, let's say that we have an option that we right. can file it in, in Indiana, or maybe we can file it in a difference. Let's say it's Chicago, right. um, you know, the region. Um, it, do you find um, that there's different values given by juries for the same injury or the same fatality in different places in the country? Yeah, absolutely. And um, th there are certain venues that just have a reputation and it's not a reputation based on anything other than experience and history. That, that tells all the parties involved in a case, that venue is more likely to deliver a high jury verdict. Um, and it could be as simple as there's an interstate that runs through that venue in which there have been notorious and historically bad accidents to uh, there's something about the particular demographics of a venue that that causes higher verdicts, and I, I don't, and I don't mean the traditional demographics of ethnicity or anything like that. I'm just talking about demographics of professions, for example, um, or sort of the makeup of uh, of the particular county that causes verdicts to be greater. Sometimes there's not an explanation. Why is that county produced larger verdicts than that county? And we can bring in all the sociologists and psychologists. There's not a great answer. It's just true that they are. And so all of that matters. And if a sophisticated plaintiff's attorney has it figured out that there are multiple venues in which they could file, that they can file where the accident happened, they can file where any of the particular defendants reside, they can file where the registered agent for the company is. Those are all factors they get to choose. They choose the one that's best for them. And on the defendant's side, many times we can't do anything about it because the plaintiff gets to choose the venue. The thing we do do about it though, is that we real, realize because they're in that particular venue, there's more value to the case and we will offer more to settle the case because we are less likely to want to go to trial because of the reputation uh, based on history of that venue as a difficult uh, venue for defendants. Yeah. And that goes back to what we were talking about, picking a lawyer who understands trials and litigation. If you assume you're going to settle the case, you may not look at those things. Um, but if you, you know, my, my strategy always has been, assume I'm going to try the case. And then most of the time the cases settle. Um, but you have to make smart decisions on, you know, where to file the case and what the, what, and, and who to bring into the case. Um, uh, certainly is a, is an important decision early on. Now these litigation, you, you, you mentioned that a trial can last or, or litigation can last for an extended period of time, because in the beginning we, we exchange a lot of written materials and documents. Uh, then we start, we go through a phase we call depositions. Um, and, and depositions can occur, you know, all over the country, depending, you know, again, these trucking companies aren't always located where the wreck happens. And so you're going to their offices or in their, the city where their headquarters, I've, I've traveled all, I mean, I've been down with you down in Texas. I mean, I, I don't know how many depositions I've taken in Laredo. I've lost count. I mean, I've flown down there so many times and done depositions because a lot of the, the drivers are, um, are coming across the border bringing in parts from like automobile, automobile parts or whatever. And that's just happened to be where the drivers, that's where the, the trucking companies will set up the depositions. But I'll also is. throw in one other factor is that, <laughs> you know, in, in every trucking case, the, there is usually um, goods being transported. 
The -hmm. goods came from a shipper. There's also something known as a transportation broker. The broker is often a third party who marries together the trucking company and the shipper. And sometimes the brokers have a major role. Sometimes they don't in choosing who the trucking company is, the routes that are run, um, the particular loads that were taken. The shipper sometimes, sometimes not, has a, has a role in that as well. Um, I've had some cases involving flatbed carriers where there's heavy equipment Uh, being hauled on a flatbed and the shipper and or the broker was the one that determined what type of trailer that was used, what kind of goods were uh, transported on the flatbed and how it was configured. And then perhaps there's a rollover that was in cause, not just by the law of physics, but by the law of physics that were created by the shipper and the broker decisions. So that's a long way of getting to this point. When we talk about depositions, you know, Of course, the depositions take place of the trucking companies, but sometimes there are these tangential or not so tangential companies like shippers and brokers that get involved as well. And that's a great point. I mean, because that's, again, another analysis that the family's lawyers has to go through is who who do we go after? And, you know, and and again, I see cases that are referred to me where they say, well, the shipper, it's really tough. There's some case law out there that makes it tough to go after the shippers but it doesn't make it impossible. And so you want to look and see how involved, whether or not the the load, who loaded it, whether it was concealed, where was the driver at when the load was put on? You know, could they see the defect that causes the, the load to fall off, for example, in a, in, a, in a case like that? And there's so many different things that you want to look at. And the documentation on those, the, the agreements between the parties is so important sometimes. Um, and so uh, those are things that, you know, lawyers look at and, um, and, and then, and also, you know, obviously if, if I'm dealing with a, 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 to the trucking company, the trucking company has an incentive if they believe it was someone else's fault to share that information as well, because they want to shift the blame to the shipper. Now, the problem with logistics companies are a lot of them don't have much insurance. I mean, it's the bigger ones do, but you've got everybody out there in the, I mean, it's amazing. You go on YouTube and watch the, the if you want to be entertained, look at the folks who are doing logistics. Right. Yeah. And then, and then even then it gets, sometimes it gets doubly complicated because who is, who's the motor carrier? So, you, you know, the shipper thought that they hired a motor carrier, but turns out the motor carrier was a broker who brokered the load to a different motor carrier. And then sometimes you get on involved in something called trip leases um, or backhaul situations where um, there are some of these truck drivers are driving for multiple trucking companies, changing the placards as they go. Um, sometimes uh, the simple question of which company is responsible <laughs> is not easy, and it becomes a fairly involved legal analysis, not just a factual one. Absolutely. And again, it's a, as a, and you know, a personal injury lawyer who does car crashes may not know those things. Um, the trucking company attorneys do because they're used to looking at those documents and they're used to trying to sort that out. But we have a lot more deck actions nowadays than I used to have on who, you know, who, which coverage applies and who is the motor carrier. Right. A lot of these, uh, we call them owner operators, independent contractors, where they own their own truck. They have their own insurance policy. There's something called um, uh, non-trucking liability or sometimes referred to as bobtail insurance. Um, and so let's use an example, um, uh, a truck driver it has a, he, he's done with his shift. He goes home, realizes that he forgot to turn his paperwork in. Uh, so he drives back to the tournament, uh, to the terminal bobtailed, has a bad accident on the way. Let's say it's the truck driver's fault. Whose insurance is at play there? Um, the trucking company, was he driving them for, on behalf of the trucking company? He was just trying to turn in the paperwork. He was not dispatched. He was not on a specific route. He was not hauling any goods. Is it his own insurance? Which is at play? Uh, depends on the policy, depends on the venue, depends on the facts. Yep. So you go through all this, doc. you get the documentation, you get all the right parties in play, you do the written discovery, you do the depositions, now uh, it comes time to, uh, in most jurisdictions, our, a mediation is encouraged. Um, and tell us a little bit about what mediation is and what the role of, the, um, of both lawyers are. Well, mediation, sometimes you'll hear the term settlement conference. They're basically synonymous. Uh, a mediation or a settlement conference is a process 
by which all the parties come together in a, in a same place. Uh, Pre-COVID, it was almost always in a location, typically the mediator's office. These days, maybe half of the time, it's through a Zoom conference. But the bottom line is, a neutral, a mediator is hired who will help with the logistics of planning the, the, the time, the place, um, whether it's Zoom or not. The parties come together and it's for the purpose of seeing if uh, through the art of advocacy and compromise, whether or not they can reach a settlement of a case. Now, you can always settle a case uh, during the middle of a case with lawyers having conversations back and forth. But the nice part about mediation is that for those hours or those days, everyone is not focused on anything else in their life, not their other cases, but simply your case. And during this mediation process, the mediator will listen to the arguments uh, from both sides. And the mediator's role is not to be a judge. It's not to be an arbitrator. It's not to make decisions but to listen to both sides and then maybe provide a little pushback. I understand what you're saying, but could the jury see it differently? Um, I understand that you think you're going to win, but for these reasons, could you lose the case? I understand that you think that the value of your claim is this, but might you have, for example, some issues with proving up all your lost wages? Those are some things the mediator might say over in the plaintiff's room. On the defense room, you might go over there and say, Look, I think you're going to have problems with your truck driver. I'm not sure the jury is going to necessarily like them. I think the plaintiff is very likable. I think these are really catastrophic injuries. And so depending on the facts of the particular case, the mediator will talk about the, 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 those issues, talk about why one party who consider taking a little bit less, uh, the other side, the defendant who really doesn't want to pay much money, talk to them about why they need to pay more. And through compromise with going back and forth with, with one party probably starting a little too high and another party starting a little too low, going back and forth through negotiations, eventually get to the point where the amount has been narrowed enough that it simply makes sense for both sides to settle the case, finding that, that number that neither side is typically excited about, but that they both can live with. And the most important part of mediation of all is that the parties are in control of the case. Once you go to trial, the judge determines what the evidence is that the jury gets to hear. The jury determines what your case is worth or not worth, the jury. And the most nerve wracking time for anyone who does trial work is when the jury is behind the walls in another room and you are completely uninvolved. You don't get to put facts forth. You don't get to put evidence forth. You don't get to cross-examine. You don't get to make strategic decisions and closing argument. That's all done. The only things left is those strangers who are involved in the jury process determining what your case is worth. That's nerve-wracking, but you don't have control. Back to mediation, during mediation, you have complete control. No one can tell you whether to settle your case or not. No one can tell you how much to settle your case for, but hopefully through the mediation process, the parties can learn uh, what the case should settle for given all the competing interest of the case. And, and, and so you obviously went through a lot of mediations as a defense lawyer, as somebody who defended the insurance companies and the trucking companies. Now you're a mediator. I'm curious, has your perspective of mediation changed since you changed roles? Well, it has changed. Well, first of all, um, and, and I, I don't say this to put anyone down, but I'll just tell you it's surprising. I, I'm surprised that there are attorneys who aren't super prepared for mediation. They don't provide the mediator with a lot of information before the mediation and that they have not captured all the information and an understanding of the law that they should. Um, and I figured, because that's what I was doing in my room, that everyone else was as well. <laughs> and I've learned as a mediator that there is not always a fair balance of good advocacy. And that surprises me a little bit. But my role as a mediator isn't to balance things out. My role isn't to make things fair. 
My role is to try to help settle the case. And sometimes I think um, uh, that, that the cases settle for what they settle for because one side had so much better advocacy than the other, and they sort of overwhelm the side with them. And so um, even though we talk about mediation as if it's a, a peacemaking process by which everyone has equal information and equal advocacy, and it all works out just fine, the fact of the matter is it's still very much a process of advocacy. Parties are still trying to win at mediation. And more often than not, one side does win more than the other side. Um, and it's usually because of preparation and advocacy um, and the underlying facts. But don't I, I think I probably, from the outside looking in, figure that everyone was advocating equally. I now understand as a mediator that really isn't the case. Yeah, and, and I, I recognize that the first time I represented a, pl a plaintiff in a severe wreck, and there were multiple plaintiff lawyers um, that represented different people. And I thought, you know, we do settlement videos, we do, um, you know, on a, on a big case, you do a whole lot of preparation. And I went in and one of the other plaintiff lawyers asked to talk to me. And I, so I went into their room and, and there wasn't even a breakdown of, of the liens and the, I mean, just stuff that I just took for granted that I thought, well, how can you even show up if you can't tell your client exactly how much money they're going to get? Um, and then I learned from that. And, and, and the sad thing was that, you know, my role was as an advocate for my client. It was to, to, get, to maximize the recovery for my client. And the client actually happened to be friends with the person who was represented by someone else. And, and I went back to my client. I said, you know, here's what I think that you're entitled to of, of this limit. There's only so much money to go around. And um, but I think that I can get you more. Um, but this is your friend and it's going to come out of your friend's pocket. So you tell me what you want me to do. Do you want me to just help work with this other lawyer and this other uh, the, your other friend, your friend? And let's just try to figure out what's fair. Or do you want me to advocate and get as much money for you as I can? Because this other lawyer is not going to go to trial because this other lawyer is not even prepared for mediation. And my client kind of was, you know, my client said, no, maximize my recovery. Right. Um, and so that's what I did. And so we drew a really hard line knowing that there's no way that that other lawyer is not going to eventually cave in and which he did. And, and so that was the first, that was a rude awakening to me. I was like, whoa, that's guys on a big case. There was definitely a difference in preparation. Right. And the other thing that's interesting, you know, as a lawyer, the only attorney client privilege conversations I'm ever involved in are involving myself and my client. That's what I knew about attorney client conversations. I find it fascinating on the mediator side. I'm in the room just with the lawyer and the lawyer's client and myself. I'm allowed under the rules of mediation to be present during those attorney client privilege communications. And, and I see an absolute difference in the way that certain lawyers handle their clients. Handle is probably not the right word. Uh, communicate is probably a better word. How they communicate. And part of it is you know, how much of a relationship have they built up beforehand? I, I have seen some fascinating um, and awesome lawyering. But in the end, I know it's because the lawyer has developed such a relationship with the client that they can just talk at a different level in front of me. It's almost, it's a little cryptic, but there's an understanding. You remember when we talked about this issue with the lien? You remember when we talked about this issue with this difficult deposition testimony that you gave? Those difficult, some lawyer, the good lawyers have the difficult conversations with their clients before the mediation. There's a lot of lawyers that have never wanted to have a difficult conversation with their client ever before mediation. And they leave it all to the mediator to yeah. sift out. And that way it becomes the mediator's fault to deliver the bad, tough news. And so that's another thing that I've learned in mediation is that some lawyers, um, you know, kind of hide the bad news until the mediation. That's not the time to hide the bad news. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I, and I've, and I've seen, again, the, I've seen, I've seen other plaintiff lawyers ask the mediator to go in and tell them 
that this is a good settlement. And, I'm, and I was sitting in the room. I'm like, well, they can't really tell him that, you know, but the lawyer didn't want to have this conversation with the client and didn't have the relationship of trust for the client. He could he could tell the client whether it was a good or bad settlement. I mean, I, I look at kind of mediation is I enjoy it because I get to spend a lot of time with my clients um, and I get to spend you know a lot of time preparing them. And then I get to spend a lot of time in a room with them. And, and I look at it as more of an empowerment. Um, I'm trying to empower my client to make the right decision. And if my client wants to settle, even if I think the number is low, I settle. Uh, even if my client wants to go to trial, even though I think the client's asking for a little bit more than maybe I think is, is fair, I will go to trial. Um, I work for my client. I just want to make sure my client knows the good and the bad and is empowered to make the right decision. And, and as a mediator, that's what we want to help you do. But sometimes lawyers have it all figured out. The mediator's role is to get out of the way um, and let the lawyer have that conversation with the client. The, the mediations I have to work the hardest are where the lawyers haven't done a lot of hard work before the mediation ever started. You mentioned that, you know, mediation, uh, it takes away the uncertainty of a trial. Um, certainly, you and I have both tried enough cases to know that we cannot predict with any certainty what's going to happen. We can, we can go based on experience. Uh, I, I've settled cases. I've had lawyer, the defense lawyers settle after we picked the jury. I've had the defense lawyers come to me and settle after the trial has proceeded. Um, so the jurors, I mean, depending on what jury you end up with, um, you know, it has a lot to do with how you think the, the ultimate outcome. I always tell my client, clients that I know the folks in my office really well. I mean, I've worked with most of these people for 20 plus years, um, and, and, and I know who's conservative, I know who's liberal, but I can't, if I ask them to give me a value on a case and write it down without talking after I tell them the facts, I, will, I can't guess the value they will give me. So I can't guess my own work coworkers what number they will get me. I certainly can't guess with any certainty what six strangers or, or depending on what jurisdiction I'm in, what they're going to give me. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's why, um, among other reasons, most cases settle because of that great uncertainty. I mean, look, we, it, it, we can get a jury verdict right if we're given a lot of latitude. I mean, if you, uh, certain cases, I can tell you the value is between five to $10 million. <laughs> But but that's a lot of latitude. Some cases I can tell you it's a it's not worth uh, less than fifty thousand, and it's worth uh, no more than two hundred thousand. But but even those kinds of estimates inside that is a wide range that we have to give because of all those uncertainties. Um, and so once we understand what the range of verdicts are then that allows us, and we're not going to get, you know, settlement is not about anybody's best day or anybody's worst day. It's about trying to come inside the verdicts uh, and trying to find that reasonable compromise. And that's why settlement makes sense. Um, you know, the things about uh, more often than not, um, verdicts are there's a winner and there's a loser. Somebody's happy and somebody's sad. With settlements, everyone's generally okay. Um, and it kind of depends on your level of risk tolerance. But back to a point you made earlier, uh, for some people, this could be the biggest financial transaction of their life um, because there is so much involved. It's the support of a family when you're dealing with a situation where uh, uh, maybe the, the, the person who was the, fi the primary financial support is deceased and the children are still young. I mean, I cannot imagine the, the burden that everybody bears in a situation like that of making sure that a smart financial transaction is made. Um, and that's only understood if you know what the verdict values are, but then you have to sort of throw away the possibilities and deal with the probabilities. And that where that's where you have to have a lot of experience with a lawyer, with someone like you, Dave. And, um, and I think, you know, and, and we don't, I mean, I enjoy, I guess I enjoy trials personally more than I do mediations. Mediations sure. can be very frustrating to me. As and a as a mediator, I'll tell you the same thing. I yeah. think I enjoy trials more than I enjoy mediation too. And, and, but as nothing makes me happier than a client 
reaching the decision they're they're comfortable with, whether that's settlement or whether that's at trial. And I I put a lot more faith in the juries than what some mediators do and what some defense lawyers do or some plaintiff lawyers do. Um, I genuinely believe jurors try to do it right. Um, and I believe, like you said, I mean, there may be a range here, but on some of these catastrophic semi cases, I mean, I've walked out of, you know, the tens of millions before because it was easy because I knew that the result was going to be large. Maybe I didn't know exactly how much, whether it's going to be 10 million or 20 million or 15 million, but you knew that your client was going to be taken care of no matter what. So it's a lot easier to roll the dice on a case like that than it is on a case where your client may be found at fault and your client may be 51% of fault in Indiana and lose and get nothing. Yeah, um, despite, and having lot catastrophic, despite having catastrophic injuries. Absolutely. Those, are the really, those have to be the toughest from the plaintiff side. Those cases where um, the, the person has been devastatingly injured and yet there is a real possibility that they may walk away from nothing. So maybe the trucking company has offered 30% of the full value of the case, which doesn't seem fair, but you have to, you have to juxtapose that against the possibility of zero. That's a tough dilemma for you. Absolutely. And we do things, and I assume the defense does as well, but we do focus groups. I mean, we run focus, I'm going to run one Saturday. We run a lot of focus groups. We try to look at the, what issues that we have. We try to find for, for folks that are listening, focus group is where you, you get panels of people together and you do it different ways, but you kind of present your evidence to see what, it, what independent people will do and you watch them deliberate. Um, and, but even that, I mean, that so you can, you can increase your odds um, of getting a decent result by listening to what people think of your issues. Um, but at the same time, on the tough, tough cases where there's comparative fault involved and you're in a state like Indiana, um, that is tough. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, one of the things I want to, I want to end with is just, you know, your mediation uh, practice now. Um, and, and I know, um, I would think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I would think with all your experience and knowledge in the trucking industry, that would make you a pretty popular mediator. Because again, just like we talked about when you're hiring a plaintiff lawyer, you need a lawyer who has the experience and knowledge and resources to handle these cases. The trucking company certainly is going to pick the lawyers that have the knowledge and the ability and skill set uh, to, to handle these cases. But if you don't have a mediator who doesn't really understand trucking, I think that's the disadvantage. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I have been uh, I've been getting retained on a lot of uh, trucking mediations. I, I think um, a, a mediator who understands trucking. I mean, first of all, it allows um, you don't have quick study. If you come to me and you say, we did a download of an electronic control module, this is what it showed, I know what that means. If you tell me this is a case in which we think the broker has liability and you tell me why, I can help evaluate that for you and your client and determine whether that means that this is a, a, a settlement number you might want to consider or not, issues of venue, who your experts are, um, you know, I, I was, we haven't talked much about the medical side, but there's something called a life care plan and understanding what life care plans have a lot of substance and which ones don't. I mean, that all matters. And, and then another issue um, is insurance. Um, the insurance issues can get very tricky, not just whose insurance has to pay, but also trucking companies have, have gotten pretty sophisticated because there's just so many tens of millions of dollars involved in insurance monies and premiums. They've gotten sophisticated. They have captive insurance companies. They have deductibles. They have self-insured retention. Sometimes they're DOT self-insured. Sometimes they have something called a corridor deductible, which is kind of a deductible above their primary insurance. There's excess coverage. There's different layers of excess coverage. Sometimes there's infighting among the insurance companies about whether certain money should be paid or not. Um, sometimes insurance companies go into receiverships and you're, you're dealing with guarantee funds. There can be a, a very complicated um, a web of issues when it comes to these trucking company cases, everything from who your experts are to what your insurance is. And so having a mediator that has a fair amount of knowledge coming into the mediation about how that web plays out seems to matter to a lot of folks. And I think for people that are listening to this, that are thinking, 
oh my gosh, you know, we have been involved in this catastrophic event um, with the semi. Why would we want to hire a lawyer who used to defend these folks uh, and, and made his whole living? His whole career was, was based upon defending these folks. And, and so I get clients that ask me stuff like that. You know, who is the mediator? I mean, I think it's important to who the mediator is. And I would just say to those folks, the, the thing that I typically, you know, how the way I answer that is, first of all, the mediator has no power to make you do anything. And so that's important. But secondly, you know, Mike has sat in with claims people. Mike has sat in with trucking companies. Mike knows what's, what, what's important to them. And I don't. I don't, I've never sat in a room, you know, where I was giving strategy or advice to a trucking company. I never heard from them what, what evidence is important to them, what's, in, what, what's persuasive to them. Um, and I think having somebody that knows that, who's had those tough conversations and who has personal experience is far better personally than me as a plaintiff lawyer. Because as a plaintiff lawyer, if you put me as a mediator, in a room with the trucking companies and their adjusters, I, we don't talk the same language. And, and so I would find it a disadvantage. So the average person would probably think, well, hiring a guy like me would be better for their case. When in fact, I would argue that hiring a person like you with your experience is far better than a, than a plaintiff lawyer. Well, the language that does get spoken inside the trucking and the insurance uh, groups that I would be mediating with um, is risk management. Um, to them, they are making making a business decision. Now, I'm not here to say that a lot of the trucking claims folks aren't empathetic, uh, that they that they don't feel for uh, the injuries and damages that have been created sometimes by their own truck drivers. They are. But as part of what they're doing in their everyday job is that they are managing risk. So as a mediator, what I am typically talking to them is about the language of risk. If you go to trial, you have this risk. If you only make this kind of job off, or if you only make this kind of settlement offer, you have this kind of risk. Um, if you decide to push on that issue, you have this kind of risk. So it's all about risk and then talking to them about the reward of maybe making more money, uh, making more of a settlement offer that they can help mitigate that risk. So that's the language that gets talked about in that room. And one that I'm you know, pretty used to talking about for three decades now. Well, Mike, I appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, to be on here. Is there anything else that you would like to add or do you think it's important for the average everyday person that's out there looking at uh, trying to protect their family? Well, um, at, at the risk may perhaps of repeating myself just a little bit, I think it's really important uh, for someone who's interested in protecting their own interest or their family to number one, uh, hire an attorney early. I know there's a lot of folks out there that say, well, if it looks like if you hire an attorney too quickly, will that make you look greedy? No, it will make you look greedy. It'll make you look smart. Second, uh, challenge the, the attorneys that you're interviewing. And I do really suggest you talk to more than one attorney. Um, before you make your decision, uh, find out about their experience, uh, find out about their game plan, find out how they're going to get you from this horrible point that you're in at the beginning of a case to what will hopefully be a successful outcome, as successful as the law and the facts will allow. Um, to stay informed, you want to make sure that the attorney is on top of his or her game. And the way to do that is having regular communication. Um, I know, especially when you're dealing with serious injury or death, it's awfully easy to say, I hired my lawyer, my lawyer's taking care of it. Um, I think it's important that it be an ongoing conversation with you and your lawyer, that you don't just go from hiring the lawyer to showing up for a deposition, showing up at a mediation, showing up at trial and say, that's all I need to do, that it has to be an ongoing experience for you. Um, none of it is necessarily a major pleasure. I get that. Uh, but it is, as we've talked about, one of the most important things you may ever deal with in your entire life. So uh, choose wisely. Um, make sure that you are protecting yourself and protecting your family um, by staying engaged in the process. Great. Well, I think that's great advice. And, and, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, one of the nice things about COVID 
is that it's made Zoom uh, so much, everybody's using it. Right. And so there's really no excuse for a law firm that's representing you to not have regular Zoom meetings. It may not be easy to get into an office, but boy, it sure is easy to do Zooms. And so there's really no excuse for a lawyer not to have update with you on a regular ongoing basis uh, through Zoom. And I would, if I were a client, I would demand that. So Me too. Me too. All right, Mike. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Dave.